So our next guest is uh, Dr. Stephanie Hikaza, who is the instructor of tubing euphonium at the University of Northern Iowa. She's a Virginia native. We're very excited to have her back uh, to give this presentation. Uh, so help me welcome Steph uh, Dr. Stephanie Hikaza. Hello, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, yes, I'm a Virginia native, Williamsburg, Virginia, and uh, I am currently living and teaching in Iowa, but up until August, I was living right down the road in Vienna, so it's really great to see some familiar faces here today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, our topic for today is the concept of mindfulness as it can be applied in the practice room, um, and especially in the applied studio, but this is kind of from the perspective of both the teacher and the student. Um, before we get into mindfulness itself, uh, I want to take a look at some of our current perspectives on practice in the brass world. So, as we know, music has become more competitive than ever, um, and especially among brass players, you know, we value hard work, long hours, blood, sweat, and tears, that kind of approach. Practice until you can't practice anymore and then practice a little bit more after that, right? Um, so I know that's kind of how, how I came up through, uh, through music school. Um, and we don't really pay attention always to you know, some of the current trends in athletics that might advocate for rest or you know, flexibility over strength or even a, a healthy mentality. Um, so we, we generally take the approach that more is better. Um, and I think this can be illustrated by uh, sort of our current uh, internet attitude toward practicing. So I have, I have collected some, some memes for us to, to, to look at how we're currently um, sort of communicating this idea to our students, for one thing. Bach is a, is a big figure in these. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this one. Um, sometimes Bach is a little bit meaner than others, so that's a, uh, that's a common theme. I've seen this outside of some studio doors at, at my school, I know. Batman, right? Batman and Robin, have you seen this one? This one has a lot of variations. I personally uh, enjoy the long tones uh, variation, but I've, I found this one too. Uh, this, this one is, um, is kind of uh, <laughs> brass specific, I think. I like this one as well. Um, now, I, I relate to this one. I mean, you do have to practice in order to improve at any instrument, and we have to try to motivate ourselves and our students uh, to practice. Um, but the most effective practicers know that more is not necessarily better, right? Better is better. So um, I think that this can also be addressed from the student perspective. Um, these are ones that I've found that sort of, uh, I think, encapsulate the music school mentality. This is a popular one, right? Um, I like this one as well. I think especially uh, a lot of our students today are feeling um, isolated in a world where they're connected by social media, but not necessarily individually connected. This is much more, uh, I think, pervasive in music school where we're literally spending a lot of the day sitting in a room by ourselves trying to solve our own problems, right? So um, here's another one, average day for a musician. And I like this one as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, the, the general consensus that I've come to after talking to college teachers, college students especially, is that um, a lot of us and, and our students are, are stressed out today. There are a lot of demands placed on our time, our energy, our finances, and everything like that. And, um, and that constant pressure can really create a, a practice room environment that's uh, maybe not conducive to, to productivity or creativity and, um, and maybe not healthy at all. So um, I think we can agree that we don't want to end up like Jim, uh, if nothing else. So uh, when I first heard about mindfulness, I think my impression was that it was about meditation. Um, you know, like me sitting in a room by myself, 
connecting with my thoughts or emptying my mind or something like that. And, uh, and it does have a meditation element, uh, but there is actually a lot more to it. It has um, several other components that are used as part of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And as I dove more into the topic, I sort of realized that um, it has a lot of applications in the practice room. Uh, so these ideas are not new. Hopefully to many of you, they'll probably be familiar. Um, and they're applicable in all areas of life. But uh, I'd argue that they could be used specifically for musicians in the practice room uh, to achieve more consistent and effective practice. So the practice can be broken down into six components. Uh, some of these are sort of what skills, things you can do, and some of them are how skills, how you can do, um, do those things. I'll preface this by saying that you know, I began uh, really studying this not because I'm great at it and I want everyone to do what I do, but more because there are things that I struggle with personally and, uh, and that I find helpful to sort of keep at the front of my mind. So a common um, sort of one minute meditation for, for mindfulness practitioners would be to take a moment to observe, truly observe what's going on around you. So everything that's in your field of vision, everything that you can hear, uh, maybe you can feel your feet on the ground right now. Maybe if I would be quiet for a moment, you would hear the hum of a heating system or something like that. Uh, maybe you can um, smell something, maybe, hopefully not. Um, this also includes inner observation. You know, how, how are you feeling physically? Observe your physical state or your mental or emotional state. That's a very common um, meditation on observation. And it's, it's incredibly easy to sort of move through the spaces that we move through in this world without really observing what's going on around us, especially these days when we're all so busy. Um, observation is really a skill, and so it's not something that you're necessarily born with, um, but like most skills, it can be developed through practice, right? But we're familiar with that idea, so that's okay, right? Um, in the practice of mindfulness, the skill of observation requires us to purposefully direct our attention to the present moment. So one idea that I, that I sort of take from this is while we cannot control what we see or hear, even though I may wish that I could control what I hear in the practice room, I can control my attention. And that's really all I can control in this situation. So the question would be, when you're in the practice room, how often do you observe yourself uh, without simultaneously analyzing or evaluating? I would think that's kind of a tall order for most musicians because our brains are going all the time in the practice room. And usually we have observation, but we also have another layer of self-analysis or, or crippling self-doubt or whatever it may be. Um, so I think one sort of uh, five minute kind of meditation that we might do in the practice room is to take a moment to, uh, to truly observe and only observe. So I would do that by recording myself um, or by just playing um, and sort of, um, sort of going through that meditation but in the practice room. So for example, um, sitting or standing comfortably, taking stock of the room around you, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, um, taking stock of your inner state, physical, mental state, uh, emotional state, um, focusing on your breath and your breathing, which most of us know we need to do as low brass players, but we don't always take that moment to maybe take a cleansing breath before we play. And then play um, with the sort of idea of observing and only observing. So the, the kind of mantra that I use in the practice room is whatever I observe, so be it. If I notice something in my playing that is pleasing to me, great, so be it. If I notice something that I don't like so much, okay, so be it. The idea is to cling to nothing and to push nothing away. So when I do this, I'll find that Sometimes I'm able to totally lock in and pay attention and observe. Other times I'm thinking about what I might want to have for lunch later, you know. But, um, but the interesting thing about mindfulness is that it's described as a practice for a reason. Uh, when you're in the practice room and your attention is wandering and you're thinking about lunch or the concert later or your jury or whatever else, that moment when you bring 
your attention back to the present. That is the practice of mindfulness. It's not really a sort of Zen state that you can be in all the time. It's just the act of saying, okay, back to what I'm doing. That's the practice of mindfulness and observation is a huge part of it. So how do we observe? Hopefully, we try to observe non-judgmentally. Now, if you think about your last practice session, maybe you ran through a daily routine, maybe you were playing etudes, maybe you were uh, running over the, the terrible licks in your brass band music, right? Um, if you think about your last practice session and keep track of some of the thoughts that are passing through your mind. You may find that some of your thoughts are objective, and you may find that some of your thoughts are a little bit more subjective and maybe veer into uh, value judgments. So this would be good or bad, or I don't know. My students have a lot of creative words for uh, <laughs> value judgments on their own playing. Um, but judgment is really, it's a uniquely human reaction. It's totally normal. It's totally human. Um, we can't avoid it. We can only raise our awareness of it. Uh, so as musicians, it's tough because we, we do have to be able to evaluate ourselves in order to improve, right? And many of us, um, you know, those, those self-evaluative thoughts mix with judgment. And of course, this is further complicated by the fact that we often use subjective language to describe our playing or how we sound, how we want to sound, right? How many times have you heard someone say, try to have a warm sound, right? What does that mean? It's subjective. So it's, it's kind of tough to observe at a very detailed level and to do so without judgment. The goal is to, in mindfulness, accept each moment without evaluating it as good or bad. Acknowledge what you observe as helpful or harmful, but don't judge it. Acknowledge your own emotional reactions, because emotions are not judgments, but try not to judge them. And this is the trickiest one. When you find yourself being judgmental, don't judge yourself for judging. That's, that's a really tough one. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very tough in the practice room, but what I would, uh, what I would recommend is another simple exercise um, where you choose an etude or a piece, hopefully something that you're pretty familiar with, and you record yourself playing it. And you think of this as just a snapshot of where that piece is in the present moment. When you hear yourself play and listen to the recording, you wanna keep a running list, a mental list or a written list of the words that are floating through your mind in response to what you hear. So you try to identify all the terminology that you're using around your own playing. So if I use the word warm, I mean, it's subjective, but you know, it's, it's at least trying to describe a tuba sound. If I use the word ugly, uh, that would be a value judgment, right? Or gross or something like that. So my question would be, well, as you think about that language that you're using with yourself, you, your next question is, would I ever use that language with my own students? Um, I know a lot of times we may use harsher language for ourselves in the practice room than we would use for a student, right? Why wouldn't you say something harsh and judgmental to a student? Well, for one thing, it's just not a very kind, <laughs> but also uh, it doesn't accomplish much, right? It's not productive to use that type of language. So the same, of course, could be said about your own attitude toward yourself in the practice room. Even positive value judgments, they make us feel good in the moment, but they don't really help us improve that much. So the task here is just to grow your awareness of the type of mental terminology that you're using in the practice room. Knowing that we cannot unthink judgmental thoughts. All we can do is just try not to fuel them by dwelling on them, by following them down a rabbit hole um, of negative thinking. We can just simply let them drift past our mental field of vision. Another central skill in mindfulness is the skill of description. Again, like observation, it is a skill. It requires practice. And usually we try to to have a degree of separation from what we're observing by sticking to the facts, who, what, when, where, what's happening. And in, in the practice of mindfulness, we try to label you know, a thought as just a thought, an emotion as just an emotion. Um, it allows us to acknowledge our experiences without letting them overtake us. 
Uh, it also allows us to observe our inner and outer state uh, without fear or guilt or other negative responses. So the aim is to observe and describe, like we were just saying, without qualitative judgment, without labeling things as good or bad. This applies to both ourselves and others, right? I think for me, I, some of the most successful, interesting master classes that I've been to were, were classes in which the person teaching was, uh, was using really specific, objective language, right? If I say to you, your articulation is bad, um, it's not very helpful, right? Um, why? What's bad about it? What can I do about it? Well, a more successful way of going about that would be to be more objective, more descriptive, right? Your articulation is hard for me to hear in this measure. It is coming across maybe in a certain way. Uh, it's uh, louder than you think it is or softer than you think it is, whatever the case may be. That type of honest description really opens the door toward creative constructive criticism, right? So we all know that sometimes the, the lazy teaching scenario happens, right? Yeah, your articulation is bad, doesn't sound good. Um, but that doesn't seem to be that helpful in a master class, and it's certainly not that helpful um, if we were to sort of think that for ourselves in the practice room. So the goal is to kind of use observation-based language to describe what we're hearing. In the practice room, the skill of description is, um, I think it can be practiced as a little bit of a almost practice reset button. So for me, I, I use this when I am practicing scales. I don't know about you, I've been practicing scales for many years and it doesn't matter how many different types of scales or modes I practice, I am amazingly capable of just completely zoning out while I'm playing them, right? Because they become so routine after a while. And, uh, and so I think they make a good exercise in description where you can take a few moments in the practice room to play something that's so familiar to you, like a scale, and sort of have a running commentary in your brain about what's happening. I'm raising my instrument, I'm taking a breath in, I'm playing a C, I'm playing a D, I'm playing an E flat when I meant to be playing an E natural, whatever. Um, I feel tension in my left shoulder. I feel, you know, things like that are just descriptions, but sometimes having that mental commentary and trying to zero in on the moment can sort of help to, um, to, uh, to clear your mind of a lot of the other junk that's floating around in there while we're practicing. I use for this the phrase, I noticed with myself. So what did you notice? I noticed that tension in my left shoulder. I noticed that I didn't get as full of a breath as I wanted to in a certain spot. Um, these are all just objective observations and descriptions, but that phrase can then sort of go into the rest of your practice. And instead of kind of scolding yourself, you're just saying, oh, I noticed this, I noticed that. So I think taking some time to hone that skill of description can be helpful to those of us who are teachers, but also, of course, we are all our own teachers in the practice room, and so we have to develop that skill there as well. The skill of one mindfulness is sort of at the heart of, of mindfulness, and you've probably heard something about this, but before we get into it, I would like to address uh, the myth of multitasking. So I'm definitely a culprit here, but, uh, but maybe you've had this experience. You're, you're talking on the phone, with a friend or something. Um, actually, it seems like most of my students don't talk on the phone anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but let's say you're talking on the phone and you're also looking at your laptop and you're answering your emails. This is great, I'm gonna talk on the phone, I'm gonna answer my emails, get both of these things done at the same time. Great, right? No, what you're really doing is you are really rapidly dividing your attention between both tasks. You're not really reading the emails fully, or responding to them, and your friend on the phone notices that you're not fully present in the conversation too, right? You're sort of doing two things badly there <laughs> instead of one thing well. So uh, the practice of mindfulness really um, asks us to set that aside. You know, we can't really do two things simultaneously unless one of those things is completely subconscious. We don't have to think about doing it. That's why 
most of us tuba players can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? <laughs> um, things like that are subconscious, but doing two things at the same time generally doesn't really work out as well as one thing. So that's what one mindfulness is about, being completely present in the moment, riveting ourselves to right now and doing one thing at a time. So if you're walking, walk. If you're eating, eat. Or if you're worrying, worry. Um, that sort, of, uh, that sort of thing is recommended by mindfulness resources, and uh, one thing that they recommend is uh, doing a, a sort of a action meditation where you choose a mundane task, like making coffee or something, and you sort of walk yourself through every task, making sure that you are paying attention to what you're doing. I'm taking the cup off the shelf and putting the cup down. I'm heating up the water. I'm pouring the water into the coffee maker, etc. cetera. Um, so when the desire to go somewhere else mentally comes up, uh, the desire to multitask, uh, you just notice it and you bring yourself back to the present moment. Again, that is the practice of mindfulness. So we've never really had as many potential distractions as we do today, right? And the act of ignoring those distractions in order to do one thing at a time um, is actually Countercultural, you know, our, our society gives us every opportunity to surround ourselves with every kind of media at all times, all hours of the day and night, right? Um, so, in that scenario, it's really no wonder that a lot of people, a lot of students, especially, are kind of tired and stressed and stretched in several different directions. The concept of one mindfulness um, can provide a break a mental break from that sort of hamster wheel kind of mentality that a lot of us can get into. Now, in the practice room, this brings us to uh, what I think is sort of the ultimate mindfulness exercise, which would be sight reading. Now, we used to have a lot of excuses about why we couldn't sight read. You know, I, I, I played all my music. I don't own any more music. I, I don't... Uh, I don't have anything else that I can sight read because I sight read it all already. Now we don't have those excuses anymore because we have the internet and IMSLP and all these places. And, and you may also find that libraries actually do have musical scores that you can go pick up and play something brand new that you haven't looked at before. Maybe something even in a cleft that you haven't read before. Um, the thing about sight reading is that it forces us to be completely present in the moment, right? Um, I have a student uh, that once I, I gave him a sight reading exercise in a lesson, and after he was done, I asked him, what were you thinking about when you were sight reading? And he told me, well, I was imagining that green line that, that goes across the screen when I do my Sibelius or Finale playback. Have you guys seen that? Um, and I was just sort of following that line and sticking with it. And I was like, that's kind of genius. <laughs> I'm going to shamelessly steal that and use it forever. Uh, <laughs> that idea, I think, is, is kind of exactly what sight reading does to you. Uh, you don't have time, you barely have time for observation. You probably won't remember everything that went right or wrong when you're done doing it. You don't have time to think about the note you just missed. You don't have time to think about the note you might be about to miss. You're just reading in, in that moment. There's only one rule in sight reading, right? Don't stop playing. So as soon as you've played a piece, then you're working on it, you're, uh, you're going into practice mode, you're taking it apart, you're playing it slowly, you're building it back up layer by layer, and practice mode can be done with one mindfulness as well. Um, but I would say that sight reading really makes us stick in the moment with that cursor. And when we go out on stage and perform, well, we can't still be in practice mode, right? When we go out on stage, we do have to kind of activate that cursor and just stay with it in the moment. So sight reading also, I think, is a good, uh, is a good example of something that can be used to prepare us in the practice room for what happens on stage when we perform. Um, this is a meme that I don't really agree with. First of all, better six flats than six sharps as I always say, uh, but, um, but also, no, you, you do simply sight read it, and the more sharps and flats there are, the more tethered to the present moment you're going to be because you have no choice, right? 
participation um, sort of goes hand in hand with one mindfulness. Think about the last time that you were in an audition setting, okay? Maybe you experienced some thoughts while you were auditioning, right? Um, thoughts about the past, thoughts about something that just happened in the audition or something that happened in a past audition, maybe thoughts about the future uh, or like the potential consequences of your playing, something like that, right? Um, that's pretty typical for us musicians. And the question is not whether that will happen to you. The question is sort of how will you respond when that type of thing happens to you, especially in an audition. It's pretty safe to say it'll happen to most of us. But one, uh, one concept from mindfulness that I really uh, connect with is the idea that the past and the future don't exist in the present moment. They can't, right? Only the present exists. The only thing that can exist in the present are thoughts about the past or about the future. So what mindfulness asks us to do is to really participate fully in every moment by recommitting our conscious thought to what we're doing and to throwing ourselves into it 100%, not scolding ourselves for whatever thoughts or things pass through our mind, but really just attempting to, again, live in the present moment at the present moment and throw ourselves into that. Um, the truth is, like, you know, that's true of whether or not you are enjoying your present activity. <laughs> you still would probably benefit from throwing yourself into that current activity. We can even go a step further and try to forget ourselves and sort of be one with what we're doing, going with the flow, acting intuitively, trusting ourselves. To, uh, to respond with spontaneity in every situation. One interesting thing is that in mindfulness uh, seminars, one way that they practice participation is they recommend a lot of activities that involve music. So for people who are non-musicians, they recommend sing while you're driving in your car, sing uh, at karaoke, dance to music. Things like that are regularly used to help people participate in the present moment because if you think about it, music does require that, right? It requires us to participate and to fully engage our senses, our intellect, our imagination. The funny thing about musicians, though, is that when we practice it regularly, we have usually reached a level of proficiency that allows us to do certain things without thinking at all and without fully engaging, without much conscious thought. Um, we're able to do things that non-musicians wouldn't dream of being able to do. So the irony here, of course, is that, you know, most of us probably decided to pursue music because of the connection and engagement that we felt with it. And sometimes, um, you know, that sense of joy and wonder or purpose that we got from participating and fully engaging in music is, uh, is somewhat lost when we're in that day-to-day -day grind of practicing. So in the practice room, look, I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, not every moment in the practice room is, is full of joy and wonder, right? Um, for a lot of us, it feels like work, uh, because it is work. It's literally what we need to do to get paid. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it does make us susceptible to non-participation in the present moment. So it's difficult to be as fully engaged in that Arben's technical exercise when you're playing it for the 100th time or the 1,000th time, right? And, you know, personally, I don't blame us at all, but I do think that uh, the antidote to non-participation is playing music that requires our full participation. So I mentioned sight reading, and that's definitely something that helps with this. But I also, um, I also recommend, in order to practice participation, that one activity that strikes fear into the heart of most classically trained musicians, improvisation, right? So, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to become the next Coltrane or the next Mozart, uh, but improvisation, all improvisation, exists within parameters, even at the highest level. So what I ask students to do, for example, is choose a, a scale or a mode of the day that's what you're trying to get into today. You might start by just playing that scale, and then you might start to vary the direction of the notes or the rhythm of the notes or the order of the notes, something like that. Um, creating patterns, repeating them, varying them, 
all of those ideas go into improvisation. Um, another idea, if you're a little bit more experienced with improvisation, would be, let's say you're playing uh, your Bordoni etude and you finish it, um, try to, in that key, improvise a Bordoni-style addition to that etude. Um, or maybe in the style of the solo piece that you're currently playing, if you're practicing that. Um, I've had students that have had success with with becoming a little bit more comfortable in certain compositional styles simply by trying to do that. I think it would bring a welcome contrast into a practice session. And for me, a lot of times what I like to do is, uh, is play along with a recording, play tuba along with a recording and improvise a bass line or improvise a harmony, something like that. You know, you could do this for two minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, but, uh, but it does always demand that goal of full engagement and full participation. So if you're doing this and you feel like you just went somewhere else mentally, you lost your attention, you lost your level of participation, then the good news is you are a human. Uh, that does happen. Um, so we have to be patient with ourselves. We have to consciously bring ourselves back to the present moment and focus on um, our physical and mental participation. Remember, that is the practice of mindfulness. The last concept uh, that I want to talk about is called effectiveness. Now, this is where it really starts to get into the mentality that, that we have and that we can have in the practice room. At any given time, our state of mind exists on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is your emotional mind, which is a state in which your emotions are dictating your decisions. The emotional mind is more reactive and intuitive than it is analytical. At the other end of the spectrum is the rational mind. This is when we consider facts and evidence to make logical decisions intellectually. Our rational mind gives us a clear view of our present circumstances along with our past experiences. So we've all been in situations where our state of mind veers dramatically toward the emotional mind or the rational mind. Uh, when we're overcome by emotions, like fear or sadness or even joy, our base psychological state takes the driver's seat. We don't have access to the rational thought that we need to navigate our, our current situation. But one thing to remember is that emotions are not bad. <laughs> they are very important signals that are deserving of our consideration. So when we're stuck in rational mind, we're only operating on the facts and the logic. We don't have access to our emotions. We can't process the meaning of our actions. Our emotions also connect us to other people and to music much more than logic does. So according to the practice of mindfulness, the ideal state of mind is a balance between the two, which is called wise mind. In wise mind, we have access to both our emotions and our intellect, and neither one dominates the other. This allows us to act effectively, which means that we're mindful of our goals, we're able to do what's necessary to accomplish them in our present situation, not the situation we wish we were in or the situation we think we deserve to be in, but the situation we're in. It means focusing on not only what feels right or what we think is right, but what will actually work in that moment based on our intellectual and our emotional intelligence. It's kind of a big concept. And I think in the, in the practice room, in music in general, if music were to be associated with either emotional or rational, it would probably be emotional, right? Because music is sort of prized as, as having uh, the ability to either convey or inspire emotional states. But the question is, what role does emotion play in the practice room? Just because I love the way that a piece of music sounds doesn't mean that I can just pick it up and play it perfectly the first time through, right? I have to take it apart and practice it. Um, and the irony here is that, you know, in order for us to eventually produce those transcendent performances that convey or inspire emotion, we actually have to approach our practice methodically, logically, rationally. Um, however, I would say that many of us have probably experienced something along the lines of when you have too much methodical logic, um, it can be kind of capable of crushing your emotional connection to what you're doing. So we need that same kind of wise mind balance in the practice room that we do everywhere else. 
that tendency to veer in one direction or the other, rational or emotional, that's different from person to person. So it's impossible to come up with a formula that will work with everyone. Instead, what I would recommend doing is, in the practice room, use, use specific exercises that feed both sides of that mind. So for example, exercises that feed your rational mind would be your slow practice with a metronome or a tuner or a drone. That would be your spotlighting an excerpt of a piece and performing it half tempo, then performing it performance and tempo, you know, alternating back and forth. This is when you, you take a section of a piece and you deconstruct it one layer at a time, practicing just notes or just rhythms or just wind patterns or just articulations. Um, identifying um, a, a passage in, in your music where you can sort of invent a technical exercise to work on the skills needed in that passage. All of these are sort of rational mind exercises. Um, they focus on logic and analysis, and we have these tools available to us um, that can help us with that analysis. Um, this is the mode that I usually find myself stuck in in the practice room, and every now and then I have to remind myself to connect a little bit more with what I'm doing. Exercises that feed the emotional mind would be uh, simply making sure that every day that you practice, you play at least one thing that you really love playing and that you really connect with. Um, I know that's a big one for me that I, I forget a lot <laughs> because I'm focusing on what's on my plate at that moment. Um, that could also mean listening to a recording that, that you really connect with, playing along with it maybe. Improvising, like I said, along with a bass line or accompaniment, something like that. Um, for me, another helpful exercise is if I'm getting ready to run through an etude or a piece, um, taking one run through where I just only focus on the music, the musical expression, instead of you know, giving myself a pass for any missed notes or any cracks or anything like that. Um, another thing that I like to have my students do is think of a word, uh, something that encapsulates the mood or the style uh, that they're going to be playing in and write that word into their music so that they can try to embody that in their playing and think about that maybe more than thinking about, okay, I have to do this with my amateur and this with my fingers and this with my instrument. Um, I think these exercises are important because um, they encourage the emotional mind to participate in our practice sessions. It helps to guard against that type of robotic performance that comes from sort of over-practicing technique without a lot of musical expression. Um, we've all probably experienced that as listeners before, but you know we have to remember that we have to practice technique, of course, yes, but it exists to serve musical expression, and that's kind of like your emotional mind um, coming into play there. It's, it's a difficult balance, I think, to, uh, to achieve, but the goal is, is to achieve that balance, to achieve a wise mind in the practice room so that we can also carry that through uh, to performance. Yes. <laughs> so, um, practice today can feel a little bit like this, right? It's overwhelming, difficult to focus, a lot of outside forces and considerations competing for our attention and kind of infiltrating the practice room. Um, this can create a practice room environment that's, that's unhealthy or that at the very least isn't helpful with productivity and especially with creativity. As you've just seen, the, the practice of mindfulness is a lot more than just the idea of meditation. And I would guess that those foundational concepts we discussed are already in use by many of us. This sort of gives a name to it. Um, but we're already using these concepts in the practice room and in the applied lesson. So it's my hope that we can continue to think a little bit more purposefully about how we can use mindfulness to get the most out of our practice sessions, to help our students get the most out of our practice sessions, um, and to really have our own version of better is better instead of more is better. So I would like to thank you all for joining me today. And um, for further information about any of this, it's all written on my blog, which is on my website. So um, feel free to check that out and to contact me if you have any questions. 
Um, and, uh, and once again, it's been a real pleasure being here. Again, I'm also a local product, a little bit further away, but still local. So, um, so thank you so much for, uh, for providing this environment to, uh, to talk about this topic. Thank you.